And before we ring the bell, let's just take a moment. Take a moment to let go of the busyness of the day. Take a moment to identify anything that might be a particular concern. And you can put that down with mindfulness. Put it down knowing that you'll be able to return to it in about an hour and a half with a refreshed mind and spirit. So it's a very wonderful, very optimistic thing to begin this practice each week. And then I thought this week we might just take a moment to try and cultivate a little bit of loving kindness before we begin. And so a helpful way of doing that is if you can bring to mind the image of someone that you love unconditionally. If you can just bring, bring to mind the image of that one person. Just choose one if there's many that come to mind. But someone that you just feel an unconditional love for good friend or a family member or a partner, grandchild, child, bring that image to mind. See that person in your mind's eye and cultivate that feeling of unconditional love and acceptance. And as you do that, notice the way the body feels and the way the mind feels that there's a softness that comes, there's a calming sense that comes. And in this way, we can cultivate loving kindness just wherever and whenever we need it. So that's just a little experiment, just a little example of how we can do that. So with that feeling of loving kindness focused on, I'll sound the bell. Let there be peace. Let there be peace. Namaskar, everybody. Welcome back. So take a moment and get comfortable, get ready for meditation, and we'll practice together. Extra cushions and mats if anybody needs them. Find a way to sit or lay that's going to be comfortable for a few minutes. can start to get in touch with the way your body is feeling right now. Look for any conflict, any obvious conflict in the physical body. And if you find any, you can make adjustments to your posture so that your body feels free from conflict. You can look for balance in the body, just making sure that there's not extra weight on one side versus the other. So finding balance. And then whether you're sitting or laying, allowing the spine to be straight, straight but not tense, So allow this straightness of the spine. Let the eyes close softly. Find a comfortable place for your hands to rest. Let your breath be natural. Breathe through the nose if that's comfortable for you. And if not, just breathe however you need to breathe. And with those simple things in place, I'll sound the bell and I'll start to guide us through the practice.
follow the sound of the bell. Follow it as it fades into silence. And let that silence be a warm invitation to turn your senses inward. Letting go of the habits of the mind which are to be busy and to be projected outward. It's okay to let go of that habit. Just turn the senses inward, become aware of what it feels like to be sitting here or laying here at this moment. There is a sense of presence in your body. Turning the senses inward, you get in touch with that sense of presence. You might notice that there is a stability, that there is a natural quietness turning the senses inward. And so with this sense of inward awareness present in the body and the mind, let's bring the awareness up to the top of the head, up to the area of the scalp, and just give yourself a few moments to open up awareness to any physical sensations in the scalp. And sometimes this first place we visit, it takes just a little while before sensations become known by awareness. So just let yourself be patient. Keep observing anything within the area of the scalp, any sensations. And then you might begin to notice sensations of temperature, a feeling of warmth or coolness, or sometimes a feeling of neither warmth nor coolness, just sort of a neutral, comfortable sense of temperature. Sometimes there's a feeling of contact somewhere on the scalp if you're laying down or if your head is making contact with some surface. There's that sensation of contact. And you might notice sensations of air movement across the skin of the scalp or through the hair. And sometimes there's sensations on the surface of the skin there can be just a little tickle or a little itch. Or sometimes there is a feeling of energy or pulsation somewhere in the scalp. So with your awareness focused here, you're just noticing any of these physical sensations as they arise. You can follow them, watch as they sometimes pass away or change. Within the area of the scalp, you might become aware of tension somewhere. If you discover any tension, just let that go. Allow it to leave the body and continue to observe, just staying with the sensations in the scalp as the tension leaves the body. Continue to observe the sensations whatever is there, as it comes up, as it changes, as it fades away. And then from the scalp, we can move the awareness downward a bit. We can feel the awareness moving from the scalp down into the forehead. And feel it moving into the temples a bit. And feel it passing down through the eyebrows, moving into the eyes. And so once again, we'll focus our awareness on these particular parts of the body and just open up to the physical sensations. Air movement, temperature, sensations on the surface of the skin. There are no sensations that you're required to feel. 
This is just your moment to experience what is happening in the area of the forehead, temples, eyebrows, and eyes. Noticing any tension, just let it go. Allow tension to leave the body. You find that you're able to do that, just unconditionally release the tension. And as tension leaves, continue to observe the sensations. So within the forehead, if the brow is furrowed, let that soften. If the temples are tight, again, just let that soften. Let the eyebrows relax if they're raised in any way. And let the eyes soften in their sockets. Just let that tension go. Let the natural sensations fill your consciousness. And then from here, from the temples, you can feel the awareness as it begins to move downward into the ears. You can feel the awareness as it moves forward from the ears into the cheekbones, as it begins to move through into the face. And you'll notice how you have the ability to guide the awareness where you want it to go. And that as awareness moves through, it illuminates all of these natural sensations in the body. And among these sensations, any tension that you discover, again, just let go. And along with that, let go of what is sometimes a habit of wanting to label everything in our experience or to judge it in some way. Just let everything unfold naturally without any kind of judgment, without feeling the need to classify it. Let tension go. Now feel the awareness as it moves from the eyes. Let it pass down through the bridge of the nose and the nose. Feel it as it passes through the lips and the mouth and the chin. Open up to the sensations. Notice tension, perhaps in the jaws. Maybe the teeth are clenched a little. Just let that tension go. You find that you can meet the discovery of tension with just an immediate releasing. It's really quite effortless, just knowing tension, allowing it to leave the body, (coughs) and then maintaining awareness. Continue to observe. Let all the muscles of the face relax. Feel yourself becoming calmer, more stable. And from the chin, let the awareness begin to move downward through the neck. Observe the front of the neck, the area of the throat, and any sensations that you notice there. You can let the awareness pass to the sides of the neck. Notice any sensations there. Move to the back of the neck. Notice sensations here. It's possible there's a sensation of contact between your neck and the chair or the cushion. Notice any tension anywhere in the neck and allow that to leave the body, allow the neck to soften. (coughs) Maintain just enough tension in the neck to keep your posture. 
Other than that, all the tension can go. And then from the neck, guide the awareness down into the shoulders and outward. Observing whatever sensations you can detect here. There may be that sensation of contact between your shoulders and the chair or the floor. Sometimes you'll be able to detect a sensation of contact between your shoulders and your clothing. There are subtle sensations here. Just let your awareness open up. Notice these sensations as they come and go. Let any tension in the shoulders leave the body. Let the shoulders drop if they're shrugged. And then from the shoulders, you can begin to move the awareness downward into the upper arms. And then we want to spend a little bit of time with each of the parts of the upper arm. The biceps or the front. And the sensations that might be there. And then moving to the inside part of the upper arm. Noticing any of the sensations there. And again, just letting go of any tension anywhere you discover it, any time you notice it. That's the perfect time to just let go. Move the awareness to the back of the upper arms, the triceps. What are the sensations? Again, that sensation of contact may be present between the triceps and the chair or the floor. Move the awareness around to the outside part of the upper arms. Observing, releasing, continuing to observe. Just maintain that continuity of awareness at all times. Staying focused in a peaceful, soft way. Let the awareness flow down through the elbow joints. Feel it moving through that very peaceful, soothing feeling of awareness moving through your body. And feel it now as it moves down through your forearms passing through the forearms and moving down into the wrists. Observing what are often very subtle sensations in these parts of the body. Letting go of any tension. Finding more and more peace and stability in the body. And letting the awareness pass through the wrists. Feel it as it moves down into the hands. Feel it moving through the heels of the hands. And whenever awareness is present in an area of the body, the sensations become known. Move the awareness down into the palms of the hands. Observe those sensations. If there's any tightness in the hands or any clutching, just let that go. Let the hands rest softly. Observe the tops of the hands. Let the awareness move down into the fingers. Observing all these different sensations, releasing and relaxing. Bring your awareness down into your fingernails now. 
And just spend a few moments here in the fingernails, focusing the awareness. Are there any sensations in the fingernails? And sometimes you discover that there is a very subtle sensation in the fingernails, almost indescribable, just a little vibration or an energy there. Very subtle sensations, just observe. Awareness of these subtle sensations help us to calm the body further, become more centered. And from the tips of the fingers and the fingernails, let's maintain our continuity of awareness as we bring the awareness to the top of the chest. Start at the collarbones, and then just begin to let the awareness flow down through the chest. Feel it moving. Feel the soothing movement of awareness. And as the awareness moves, just notice all of the sensations that it's illuminating. Everything you feel in the chest, all the way down to the base of the sternum. And letting go of any tension as you pass through. And you can begin to move the awareness outward through the rib cage. Remain attentively aware. Remain interested in the experience. And then you can bring the awareness to the underarms. Focus on the sensations there. Begin to allow the awareness to move softly down through the sides of the body. Feel it passing through. Bring it down, all the way down to the waist. Noticing the sensations. No judgment. No thought. Just releasing. Letting go of tension. Being aware of sensations. And then move from the waist. Bring the awareness forward into the belly. And with your awareness focused on the belly, just observe the rising and falling. Sensations of rising and falling as the belly moves with the breath. Or sometimes a feeling of expansion and contraction. Let any tension in the belly go. Just let it leave the body. Let the belly soften. Observe the sensations. Sometimes after releasing tension in a part of the body, you'll find that you're able to observe even more subtle sensations. As the tension goes, the awareness becomes more focused. And from the belly, we'll maintain our awareness and we'll move around to the top of the back. <clears throat> you can start at the base of the neck and Feel the movement of awareness. Really try to feel it as it moves down through the shoulder blades and throughout the upper third of the back. Notice the sensations. And any, anywhere in this upper third of the back, the sensations, any tension, allow that to leave the body. <clears throat> if you discover any sensations that are unpleasant or maybe a feeling of discomfort, you can allow extra space in your awareness around those sensations. 
And you can just try that, just experiment with it. Allow extra space, allow extra compassion. Don't judge any difficult sensations. Just try to let them be as they are with no resistance not pushing them away, just allowing. See if you can release the tension around these sensations and just open up into this deep, expansive awareness. Move down through the middle third of the back now, really remaining focused and attentive offering all the spaciousness that the sensations of the body require. Letting the awareness flow downward through the lower third of the back now. Allowing tension to go. Letting awareness illuminate the sensations of the body just as they are. And then from the lower part of the back, let the awareness begin to flow downward into the sit bones, and through the hips, and through the pelvis. Again, try to really feel the movement of awareness. You find that it is observable. And as awareness moves, any of the sensations, might be sensations of contact or bearing weight on the sit bones or through the hips. Let all the muscles of the pelvic area relax. And let the awareness flow down further into the thighs. And then spend a little time in the different parts of the thighs. These are large muscle groups in the body, so focus first on the top part of the thighs, all the way down to the knees. And then move the awareness a bit further to the outside part of the thighs, the outer surface moving all the way up and down, and then bringing the awareness down to the underside or the bottom surface of the thighs. Just noticing those sensations, letting tension go, and moving to the inner surface of the thighs all the way up and down, just observing, releasing. Let the awareness flow softly through the knees, through the joints of the knees, allowing all the space necessary for sensations to be known. And you can feel as the awareness flows a bit further now through the knees down into the calves. You can kind of feel it moving throughout the calves, illuminating the sensations, giving you the opportunity to let go of the tension, and then feeling as that awareness moves around to the area of the shins, Observing and releasing, moving awareness downward through the ankles. Just continue to be attentive, aware of the sensations, letting tension go. And then feel as the awareness moves downward into the feet. Notice sensations in the heels, sometimes the feeling of contact, 
and then notice the sensations as awareness moves through the soles of the feet and then through the balls of the feet and let any tension go in the feet as you move through bring awareness around to the tops of the feet feel as it flows down through it begins moving into the toes observe the sensations in the toes and then we'll bring the awareness into the toenails. Just focus there for a few moments. Allow time. Just be patient. Continue to focus on the toenails. Open up the awareness. And you might begin to observe very subtle sensations in the toenails. Allow the feet to relax completely. And then from the toenails, we'll move our awareness once again up to the top of the scalp. So maintain your continuity of awareness. And returning to the scalp, this time at your own pace, you can just start to move your awareness back down through. Guide the awareness part by part. And you could do that more quickly if you'd rather, or continue to do it slowly, anywhere in between. But do take at least a brief moment to touch base with the sensations in each part of the body. Noticing and releasing tension once again, anywhere you discover it. Knowing that at any time, you can release tension in the body. And as you do that, you'll also be releasing some of the latent negative energy in the body that caused the tension. And maybe it's a little bit of fear from some experience or from some worry. Or maybe it's from stress, from challenges in life. When you discover this tension appearing and reappearing, knowing that Tension occurs as a response to difficulty and stress. You can let it go again and again, finding deeper and deeper levels of peacefulness in your body, letting go of any negative thoughts, And once you've had a chance to move your awareness through your body, you can bring it up to the base of the nose. And here we'll start just focusing on the little patch of skin beneath the nostrils and above the upper lip. And then you can expand the awareness just a bit further into the rings of the nostrils, the outer rings, the inner rings of the nostrils and also become aware of the nasal passages. So you have this triangular area of the nose. And with your awareness focused here, just become aware of the movement of the breath. And just notice when you're breathing in. And notice when you're breathing out. Just be aware of that, the movement of the breath, breathing in and breathing out. And as you remain focused on that movement of the breath, try to stay with the breath for its full duration. Just really staying with <clears throat> the in-breath as it 
comes in, it slows, it pauses, reverses direction, and it becomes the out-breath. Stay with each out-breath, observing as it comes, in, goes out and slows, pauses, reverses direction, becomes the next in-breath. Stay focused on this movement of the breath. You might notice quite naturally that some in-breaths are a bit longer than others, some are a bit shorter. The same is true of the out-breath. And as you observe the movement of the breath, Anywhere within this triangular part of the nose, this area here, just see if you can detect the touch of the breath as it passes through. Observe the touch of the breath. And then you might notice, observing the touch of the breath, that there are even more subtle sensations Breathing in the relative coolness and dryness of the breath. Breathing out the relative warmth and moisture of the breath. Just stay focused on the breath. Each in-breath, each out-breath the touch of the breath and the sensations. And if anything comes up as a distraction that maybe pulls the awareness away for a moment, the moment you notice the distraction, just turn your awareness back to the triangular area of the nose. Focus once again on the movement of the breath the touch and the sensations of the breath. There's no need to react to distractions in any other way. Just observe and release. Bring awareness back to the breath. Any sounds that come up, just use those sounds as something like a bell of mindfulness enabling you to return your focus to the breathing. Don't need to react in any negative way. Just return awareness to the breath. Sometimes sensations in the body might pull the awareness momentarily. And if you notice that happening, Just be very equanimous and very peaceful and guide the awareness back to the breath. You can let go of any distracting sensations in the body without reacting in any way other than to use them as a bell of mindfulness to return to the breath. And finally, working with the mind, noticing how the mind itself can become distracted by thoughts or images. Use these moments of distraction as a bell of mindfulness. Just bring the awareness back to the breath. And stay focused on it completely. The movement and the touch and the sensations. And let's just share a couple of minutes together in silence. A couple of minutes and then I'll sound the bell.
just very gently take a minute to come on back. Feel the compassion that you've cultivated during that meditation for your own body, and for your own being. I think that's one of the one of the wonderful benefits of meditation, kind of a side effect. It just happens sp- spontaneously. We started with a few thoughts of loving kindness when we began, and now. There's a feeling of compassion that we have from spending some time practicing. So, just a wonderful thing. We keep that going. There's no need to abandon that or to let it go. You can just keep that going at all times. Whether you're here or back at home, I have a little poem I'll share with you as we're kind of transitioning. Uh, This is a poem by Karen Mason Miller, who does some poetry and some writing about meditation practice. Um, And the name of this poem is called, Who Turns? Who turns this into that? Sound into noise. Aroma into odor. Taste into pleasure or disgust. Who turns yes into no? Grace into unkindness. Who turns the present into the past? Who turns the now into the not now? As it is into as it should be. Silence into boredom, stillness into restlessness, the ordinary into the menial. Who turns pain into suffering, change into loss, grief into woe, woe into the story of your life? Who turns stuff into sentiment, Desire into craving, acceptance into aversion, peace into war, us into them. Who turns life into labor, time into toil, enough into not enough? Who turns why into why not? Who turns delusion into enlightenment? Who thinks, who feels, who senses, who turns? All practice is the practice of making a turn in a different direction. Beautiful poem by Karen Mason Miller. So, all right. Well, we'll... uh, We'll begin. We've got some things to talk about with regard to the Noble Eightfold Path that we started last week. And I think some of you will need the handout um, on Sila, which I have here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Would you mind, Joni, since you're up, maybe passing these out? Um, This is from last week for whoever needs that. And then for this week, there's a um, and I'm, I'm confident we'll get to this. So uh, for this week, there's a handout. Uh, there's actually two. So we get, thank you, Joni. And then, so there's both of those for this week. Yeah, a little bonus material. Keeping my belly relaxed. 
hanging out. <laughs> yes. I have not heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> Belly's hanging out. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a good posture for doing it. I got all the room in the world that I need for that to happen. But that's a habit place for me of tension is in my belly. I don't know if maybe that's in to some degree maybe a guy thing because you know we try to kind of tighten up the belly so we don't look you know so sloppy. That just mine. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so it's an everybody thing. Um, so, uh, last week we started having this conversation on sila, which is the first kind of category of the Noble Eightfold Path. And sila is usually translated as ethical conduct or virtue. So, um, the, uh, there's the handout with just the black Dhamma Chakra on it. Um, that's the one from last week. So just a, we'll reference a couple of things in that. Um, but I think it's helpful to keep in mind what the Noble Eightfold Path is for. And it's, um, it's not designed as something that is supposed to be cumbersome or complicated or difficult for us to understand and therefore difficult for us to practice. Um, really, it, now it, it may seem like that's the case just because this is something that is for most of us a foreign thing we haven't we haven't really studied this before but really what this is designed to do is be something that is is really user friendly that's very um, accessible uh, for just normal people like us to use and what it's designed to do is to be a direct path between where we are and freedom freedom in the body and the mind and the heart and the spirit and the feeling of peace and love and joy. So really that's what the Noble Eightfold Path is. And I wanted to share that just because sometimes when we start with this topic of sila, with this, which is ethical conduct, we think that maybe this is something a little bit like the Ten Commandments or like a list of things that are wrong about us that we need to overcome. And it's really nothing like that at all. But just think of these as some some ancient practices that are just the best shortcut to get where we want to go. And there's a lot of real profound uh, teaching within them. So within ethical conduct, um, we have right speech, right action, and livelihood. And really the way we work with those three is pretty similar for all three of them. So it's a, it's a good one to just kind of talk about in... Uh, as one thing. And a great way to summarize what sila is, is to say abstain from all unwholesome actions, perform only wholesome actions, and purify the mind. And you'll find that the purifying of the mind part is quite automatic as a result of the first two. So what are unwholesome actions? Um, it's not a moralistic statement. Uh, it's not like um, uh, it's not like talking about sin here, but really, you could look at unwholesome actions as anything that you could say or do that would maybe just upset the balance, the peacefulness, the harmony of another person. So, anything you could say or do that would upset somebody else that doesn't have like a uh, um, a teaching benefit to it. You know, I mean, for example, you might, if you see a child who's about to pull a hot pan of water off the counter towards them, you know, you might shout very loud and, and scare them and even make them cry. Um, but that's not, you know, that's not harmful speech. Your intention is to help, you know. So um, we need to be aware of, you know, what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. So. Anything we do uh, that upsets the balance or the peacefulness or the happiness of another person, and, but it, it doesn't have a wholesome intention behind it, like the case of trying to protect a child or protect someone from getting hurt. So abstain from all the unwholesome actions. Any, any words, any deeds, just abstain from those. And instead, practice only wholesome actions. 
And uh, the neat thing about this teaching is that if you abstain from unwholesome actions, everything left is wholesome. So it's kind of simple. Just avoid the unwholesome stuff. Everything else is fine. Um, and so we went through a lot of this material last week. So that's a little bit of a uh, um, that's a little bit of, re of a review of it. Um, and then I thought I'd just kind of talk about the the detail behind right speech, as far as the teachings are concerned, uh, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. With each of these, there are four abstentions. So again, we're on this. If you abstain from the unwholesome, what remains is wholesome. So here's what you would abstain from, and this is uh, from the traditional teachings. For right speech, um, you would abstain from false speech or lying. You would abstain from abusive speech. You would abstain from divisive speech. And then you would abstain from idle chatter. And I'll talk about that idle chatter a little bit. Um, these were often given as directions in a monastic setting, and in a monastic setting there was kind of this noble silence. So it was like people wouldn't talk uh, unless it was absolutely necessary. And for training purposes, you could see how that would be important because if you just start with idle chatter in that setting, you know, pretty soon you're talking about politics and you're talking about um, you know, this person and that person and idle chatter can kind of morph into unwholesome chatter. So that's why that one was in there um, as, as something to be abstained from. So you can kind of take that one in the context uh, with which it was taught. Um, but we might notice that in ourselves that if we, if you're just sitting around with somebody and you're just, you, you are just having idle chit chat, Notice kind of the way that goes sometimes. I mean, sometimes the stuff that's interesting to talk about is maybe the stuff that's a little bit unpleasant, right? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's just a little more entertaining. So we might talk about, did you hear what happened to so-and-so or what this person did or what that person did? So it's just, you can just maintain an awareness of that and how, how maybe that feels in the body uh, when you do that. So for me, that's kind of what I do. It's just, it's one of those things to be watched. Um, and then uh, that can also kind of move us towards divisive speech, which you know, probably the best example of that is when we hear politicians speaking, and it can be whichever side they're on. Um, you know, the, the way they're speaking is to kind of cast doubt on the other side and to make their side sound better. And while they may have some real honest, true points within that, there's this divisiveness that's created as a result of the way they do that. And I've also heard politicians who have retired from politics and who are interviewed on television, and it's amazing how much sense they make. Suddenly, they've let go of these extreme positions in one direction or another, and they talk about stuff that just absolutely makes sense. You know, So it's there, but abstaining from divisive speech, just bringing things up that might cause a little friction between friends or between couples or between a person and their work relationships. So just some things to think about there. And then as far as right action is concerned, again, there's four absten abstentions. Abstain from harming living beings. Um, and this is often uh, stated as sentient beings. So anything with some form of rudimentary consciousness. So that includes insects. Um, it does not include plants, although I refrain from harming plants unless I absolutely need to. So I take them for nourishment. I mow the lawn because I don't want to get a ticket and I don't want my neighbors to get mad at me. Um, and, and there's some of those kinds of things, but uh, abstain from harming living beings and then abstain from killing. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit just in the context of consumption and, and what we eat. Um, for me, vegetarianism works pretty well. I've been doing it for over 10 years, and it just happens to kind of fit with, with what I do. Um, and for me, that's good. My dog is not a vegetarian. Uh, her place in the universe right now is one where she needs to eat meat. And so I get her meat and she eats her dog food and that's what she has. 
And so it's not like a, you know, it's not this rigid, um, every, you know, everyone must abstain from, from eating meat or that kind of a thing. Um, there's also people who health-wise just can't do vegetarianism. I can't do veganism. I did veganism for nine months and uh, my health slowly declined. So I switched to vegetarianism, which means that um, now I take in dairy and those kinds of things. Um, so it's kind of a middle path. But you can just sort of think about that. For me, it works. For other people, not so much. Um, and there's a real big kind of social aspect to this too. So that, but it's just something that you might want to consider. Or you might want to consider reducing consumption of meat, for example. Um, the next one, abstain from taking that which is not freely given. A lot of times this one comes up as um, not stealing. But I like to go a little further with it and say, you know, if something is not freely offered, don't take it. Sometimes we're a little coercive. Um, in the business world, we used to be very coercive. We would take that which was not freely given all the time by ratcheting down our vendors and our employees to get more for less and um, pushing people. And, you know, this manifests in all sorts of ways in sales and different things. So that's just something to think about. Abstain from taking that which is not freely given. And then abstain from misusing sensuality. And what that means, depending on the context, sometimes this is sta uh, stated as abstain from misusing sexuality. Um, that would be more in a monastic type setting. Uh, but to broaden it out, you can say misusing sensuality. And sometimes we misuse sensuality uh, by using it as a way to kind of anesthetize ourselves from uh, things that are difficult. So we might overindulge in certain you know, sense pleasures. So, um, and that can prevent us from doing the practice, which will prevent us from making progress. So that's why that abstain from misusing sensuality is there. And then right livelihood. Um, there are four abstentions in livelihood. These are a little more traditional and they're kind of, you kind of get the sense that they're quite ancient. Abstain from trading in weapons, abstain from trading in living beings, abstain from trading in meat, fish, or flesh of any kind, and abstain from trading in intoxicants. And so I'm betting most of us have those bases pretty well covered in our livelihood, but, um, well, again, um, you know, you have to look at the context and you have to decide what's right for everybody. So in our culture, most people grew up eating meat and, you know, until I decided to become a vegetarian, I, there was no problem with me eating meat either. You know, so I really try not to like bring a judgmentalism to that. But yeah, if you wanted to say in a perfect world, we could avoid eating meat and fish and poultry and all that other stuff. And if we did, I mean, environmentalists say that that would be like the single most important thing we could do for the environment would be to eliminate um, uh, animal products like that from our diets. Uh, because of all the uh, greenhouse gases that are used, all the, all the water resources, you know, all the fossil fuels that are used in the process. So, you know, sometimes you can think of these as maybe in a perfect world kinds of things. But sometimes that's where it starts. It's just, yeah, how could, how could we do that? So for me, if I was a farmer, I would farm vegetables, but I wouldn't farm... Um, animals for slaughter. You know, I might have a cow um, who I would take milk from, but uh, the cow would also get a lot of love too, you know, so that's just the way I'd work with it. But yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's... Yeah. 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 So I, th I think it's one of those things that's helpful to just sort of think about it, you know, and, and, and just a little contemplation and you might, yeah, you might change the way you look at these things or you know, maybe, maybe change how it is that 
um, how it is that you consume meat. Um, yeah, so those are the uh, abstentions for right livelihood. What I, what I like to say with right livelihood, I mean, this is the way, however we make our living, um, you know, many of us are in positions where we don't really have the luxury of deciding, oh, I'd rather do something else. You know, I'd rather, uh, you know, give all my time to helping people who are sick or, or uh, you know, abused or those kinds of things. We don't really have that maybe as a realistic option in our lives. Maybe we work in a clerical job where we're really kind of, you know, not connected to any direct product per se. Um, but in cases like that, while well, your, your conduct at work, you know, you can just work toward how can I make my coworkers happy? You know, how can I, how can I make this a pleasant environment for all of us to show up in every day? You know, so you can, you can do that sort of thing. Um, I've shared the story a few times of my son when he went to work uh, at a new job several years back now. Um, he, uh, he was in his mid-twenties at the time and there were a bunch of other guys in their mid-twenties and there was, you know, kind of a lot of vulgarity and trash talk and, you know, kind of nasty conversation, which you can probably imagine. And, um, uh, and he really, you know, he didn't care for that. I mean, he's been practicing as well for many, many years. And uh, he actually got the courage to say to the guys, hey, you know what, I, you know, I just, I don't feel good when we talk that way. I don't like to talk that way about, you know, women or people's sexual orientation or any of that stuff. I just, you know, I'd rather not do that. So he didn't. And it was amazing because the experience he had was that it changed the tone um, that people did sort of soften the way they spoke. They weren't, there wasn't that degree of vulgarity. And I think, you know, having the courage to do that was amazing because it kind of created a safer place for those other guys to be. You know, maybe just a place they hadn't been before. You know, because people get in that mindset. You know, this is the way, yeah, this is the way you talk. Yeah, yeah, locker room talk. Right, exactly. Yeah, real, real good example. Yeah, not 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 all guys do. Not all guys do. Yeah, most of them don't. But um, yeah, so for me, I I think of right livelihood. For most of us, um, yeah, that's just it's about how can we create a safe, pleasant, healthy work environment for those of us who are in this particular job, and so that can be your right livelihood right there. Um, the five precepts, these are a real common teaching, um, and so I'll just, uh, I'll read these briefly, but they sort of summarize all of the stuff on that previous page. So a lot of people will take the five precepts, uh, and when a person goes into a monastic ret retreat or a long-term retreat, um, you will take these five precepts uh, when you begin, and that's kind of the initiation into it. So I undertake the precept to refrain from harming living beings. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not freely given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false or harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from intoxicating drinks and drugs which lead to carelessness. The thing about the intoxicating drink and drugs thing, I mean, if you have a few beers here and there, or a glass of wine or a cocktail, that's not a problem. Uh, in a monastic setting, you can't do it. But really, what this talks about is that, you know, uh, you can easily get caught up in using alcohol as like a substitute for dealing with your problems. I've done that. and. Um, what you learn is you really can't make any progress on the path until you don't do that anymore. So that's what that one's for. So it's not, yeah, you don't have to worry about it if you go out to dinner, have a few glasses of wine, that kind of thing. Um, think about it more as something that is, is really kind of numbing, numbing the mind and the senses to more important things that need to be dealt with. Um, so these are the um, these are the teachings on sila, with, which is ethical conduct. 
So for these, I like to just kind of leave these, um, you know, it, to each individual, how it makes sense to work with those um, and to not think of them as something um, that you should feel guilty about, but think of them more as ways to think about how you interact with other people and the world around you that might be new ways of kind of setting yourself free, if that makes sense. Stuff that we just never really thought about before, like the thing with my son and the conversations at work that was like, wow, that was a new source of freedom that just wasn't there before. And then it was. So just a little example. So that was kind of what I wanted to, to cover from last week um, before we get into this week's stuff. Any questions on any of that? That was a good comment, Joni. I appreciate that. Well, actually, it's a, kind of a situation that my daughter is at Rose Falls, and she's in neuroscience and maybe biology or something. Well, you know what that was. Mm -hmm. Now, she... She kind of talked about if you're going to work in a lab, you have to work on animals, you know, on like rats. I mean, that's how they mm -hmm. that's how they discover it. Yeah. And I said, kind of like, I mean, I did not say it in the first person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, you know, I mean, she's got to make a choice, and she's doing, you know, those discoveries help a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, I mean, I'm not. Um, it's just kind of a. Mm-hmm. I would maybe kind of try to sway her, but I, you know, she's just come so far in so many ways from so many other problems that I wouldn't be like, you can't. Yeah. But it was something that kind of inside me, just kind of like. Sure. And I, I think something like that, yeah, you know, those are, mm -hmm. those are areas where we have to be careful because if you've got a student who's in that environment, I mean, it's a big deal. They need to do their assignments. They need to do what you know, what their instructors are, well, and then, you know, but maybe somewhere in there, there's, from that comes, is it possible to do it with less animal research? And certainly it is, because there's a lot of stuff now that says, you know, no animal testing is, is, uh, is done um, well, in regard to this. And this isn't for cosmetics. Right. This yeah. This is for, like, this hard science. Yeah. Right. Mm hmm Yeah, so there's going to be so there's going to be some um, some real benefit to humanity as a result of this kind of work. And so you know there's the intention behind this is wholesome and it's positive. So it's not like killing for fun, yeah, or that you don't care or wanting to harm, but it's more of a well, this is the environment and the culture that we find ourselves in. And in that particular environment, in a lab setting, there's, there, you know, animals are used. And so there's a way to bring compassion to that. But knowing that your intention is wholesome, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's yeah. really where the rubber yeah, hits the road. We kind of talked about that, if you can kind of set up an intention, kind of like, you know, thank you for yeah. presenting yourself so we can, you know, Right. It's kind of a... Yeah. Yeah. In, in uh, Japan, kind of the most common thing they say, they say, m most, most people actually have found, um, they say, uh, itadakimasu, before they start to eat. And what that means is, thank you for the food, and thank you to the food for giving itself. So that's kind of a neat, you know, that's kind of a neat thing, whether they're eating you know, fish or meat or just vegetables or whatever it is, they say that. But I, I thought, wow, that's really kind of profound. You know, thank you for the food. Somebody brought it to you or provided it to you or cooked it for you. And thank you to the food for giving itself to me so that I can live. Kind of a, kind of a neat thing. In, in Zen, kind of the, the main Japanese religious belief, um, 
they have a, a strong belief that everything is sentient, that there isn't anything that is not sentient. So plants are sentient, water is, rocks are, mountains are, the sky is, you know, everything has kind of got like a spirit quality to it. Um, and some of that goes way back to the Shinto traditions, but it's kind of a neat thing. There's just more of a respect for every living thing, or everything, rather, is really a living thing, and it all has value, and it all matters. That makes me think of Native Americans, yeah, exactly. too. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Everything, very much so. Everything is Tao. Yeah. yeah. And, and they give thanks. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. For the food that gave itself up for them. Yeah. I mean, everything. Right. Yeah, and and in sometimes the um, uh, you know they will maybe wear animal skins or like an animal head in some of their rituals, and that's um, that's not like a trophy thing. That's more of a that's a um, a gratitude. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know celebrating the spirit of this creature who gave its life so we could eat, kind of a thing. So it's, you know, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. And, and they eat what they hunt. Yep. And they use everything. They don't waste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What you know, the skin or the whatever yeah. they use. Yeah. Yeah. Everything gets and used. Honor it. Right. Yeah. Well, and actually, when you do see them wear, like the Sioux, for example, as a buffalo or whatever, they are. That, they metaphorically are that animal. It's like now we are connected. Now we are one. And that was. Probably the beginning of religions too, uh, yeah. in that sense of, um, because of like a, a wolf when it kills something doesn't have a ceremony. There are some animals that have ceremonies, elephants and stuff, they do, but the human being when they did take the, the meat, mm -hmm. that was what they became. Whether it was in the Northwest and it was the raven and the salmon and the whale, that was their totems or their spirit because that was their life force. Mm -hmm. Food is your life force and therefore your Yeah. Your yeah. So for us now we have, you know, we kind of have the luxury of options that other people, you know, probably didn't. And uh, so like I say, I mean, I tread real carefully with this stuff. I, you know, I people ask me about vegetarianism. I talk about it. I, you know, I say there's there's real benefits to it, but um, if that's not where you're at, then that's not where you're at. It doesn't mean that you're at a lower place. It just means that's not where you're at. So it's okay. You know, it's okay. So you, but so you work with you work with everything, um, the best you can, the Thank best you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, that's a that's a wonderful thing, and it's the intention. I've, I've shared the story before of, um, you know, kind of the idea of intention that um, if, if you have a person who plunges a sharp knife into the body of another person and that person dies, um, okay, if scenario one is that that person was a robber and they were trying to steal this person's money and so they stabbed him and killed him. Or two, same in general, you know, in a broad sense, the same thing happens, but it's a surgeon sticking a knife in a person to try and save them from a disease. Same action is taking place, really, you know, knife goes into a person, person dies. The intention you know, that's what's behind it. And even our law recognizes that, right? I mean, they, they ask what the intention was on something, and, and if a person intended to harm another person, you know, they'd get a much stiffer sentence than somebody that was just a complete accident, you know? So, I mean, we recognize this even in our laws. But, yeah, so the intention is the, is the thing behind it. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is great stuff. We'll start talking about this a little bit today, um, right effort, and we'll probably uh, continue on it next week. Um, but now uh, we're kind of moving into the second category on the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, which is called Samadhi, and that means mental development. 
And I think this one is just wonderful because this is one of the few traditions where there's such an emphasis on you need to get involved and you need to do the work. But if you're willing to do that, you know, you're going to get the benefit of all this wonderful practice. So samadhi is mental development. And this one contains um, the steps of right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And so tonight, I just wanted to focus on right effort, because um, right effort is it's a fantastic teaching and practice. So I'll just read kind of this first paragraph. Looking back at sila, or eth- ethical conduct, which we just reviewed, we might summarize it this way. When we say or do anything that hurts another being, that upsets their equanimity, or that causes them to suffer in any way, we ourselves will suffer. The reason for this is that in order to generate, uh, or that in order to say or do something harmful to another being, we must first generate a tremendous amount of negativity in our own minds. The result of this is suffering in ourselves and in the other person. And. I need to find my giant size print. There we go. Um, on the other hand, when you abstain from harmful, unwholesome words and actions, you cause no suffering in others and you cause no suffering in yourself. In addition, when negativity is absent from the mind, you automatically begin to purify the mind. So this is kind of along the lines of, if you abstain from what is unwholesome, everything else is wholesome. Same thing is true of the mind. Abstaining from uh, negativity, unwholesome thoughts, um, you automatically begin to purify the mind. And then following sila, the second category in the Noble Eightfold Path is samadhi, or mental development. I already mentioned it consists of those three things, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. But right effort, an incredibly important step on the path. In fact, the proper practice of right effort is amazingly transformative. The Pali Canon describes four types of right effort. The first right effort, and these are like specific practices, these four. The first right effort is to prevent the arising of any unarisen, unwholesome states of consciousness. And this is in ourselves. Prevent the arising of any unarisen, unwholesome states of consciousness. Unwholesome states of consciousness are typically defined in this uh, teaching as those that are based in greed, anger, and delusion. Okay? So the first, uh, the first right effort is with a degree of mindfulness, you're aware of what's going on in your consciousness. And so um, maybe you're a person that does a lot of self-blame or a person that feels a lot of guilt um, or a person that feels a lot of anger. And so at some point you become aware, you know, what's in your consciousness. And sometimes you become aware that, hey, right now, because I've been practicing with some mindfulness and some meditation, I'm feeling quite calm and loving and peaceful. You know, I don't have that feeling of anger in me right now, or I don't have that real, you know, self sort of loathing, self judgment going on right now. So there's an awareness of what unwholesome states have not arisen, and then uh, working to prevent them from arising. And so just kind of working with that mentally. Yeah, I'm not feeling angry. And so that's a great place to be. I'm going to work on not allowing anger to develop in my consciousness or to allow um, you know unreasonable fear or hatred or ill will or any of these unwholesome mental states and again you could easily summarize it by saying things that are based in greed anger and delusion The second right effort is to abandon any unwholesome states of consciousness that have already arisen. So this one, 
is even more straightforward. If you find that you're angry, is it possible to release the anger? If you find that you're being judgmental towards yourself or others, is it possible to let go of that judgmentalism? And I'd like to suggest that yes, it is possible and it is often as easy as just making the decision to do just that. It's really possible that you can be aware, hey, I'm angry. Why am I angry? Is it possible for me to let go of this anger? And the answer is, yep, it is. It is possible. Maybe not always in every single case, but you'll find quite often you're able to just identify these unwholesome states and release them, just like the tension in the body, right? Just noticing that, making the decision, I'm going to let that go. I'm going to let that leave my consciousness. The third right effort is to cultivate wholesome states of consciousness that have not yet arisen. And wholesomeness, wholesome states of consciousness, kind of the flip side of, uh, of greed, anger, and delusion. The flip side of that is uh, states of consciousness that are based in generosity, virtue, and mindfulness. Generosity, virtue, and mindfulness. So, again, the third right effort, cultivate wholesome states of consciousness that have not yet arisen. When we all sat down and before I rang the triple bell, um, we cultivated a little bit of loving kindness. Where it wasn't there just a few seconds before. But we envision this person that we have unconditional love for some, some person out there, unconditional love. And what is that feeling in my heart when I think about that unconditional love? And so right there, we just, in a very simple, very quick and immediate way, we cultivated that loving kindness. It just, there it was, you know, out of seemingly nowhere. But we're able to cultivate those wholesome, positive states really anytime we want. Um, and... You know, in a way, I don't want to like oversimplify this, but in a way I do. Because for, for so many of us, we're so convinced that the answer has got to be something really difficult to get to. You know, that we really have to jump through a lot of hoops and we really have to push ourselves and torture ourselves for years and years and years to really develop any kind of spiritual advancement or any kind of freedom. But the truth is, is that if you just took these four right efforts and you just practiced these, just tried to kind of say yes to each of these. If it was posed to you as a, can you do this? The first one, the second one, the third one, and the fourth. And if you just said, well, let me try. Let me try and do that. Let me try and do that. You'll be amazed at the change that will take place. So in some ways, yeah, let this be that simple. Something that is just profoundly easy to do. Say yes to the question. You know, ask yourself and pose these to yourself in the form of a question and then practice saying yes to it and really trying to do it. And then the fourth right effort, and we'll probably leave it here uh, with this um, for tonight, the fourth right effort is to strive to maintain and perfect wholesome states of consciousness that have arisen. Um, so when wholesome states have arisen, and maybe I'll just kind of give a sneak, sneak peek into it a little bit. You know, maybe you have a, a, a wholesome state um, of appreciative joy, where somebody had some success, and you see them having success, and you're glad that they did. And then, there can be just a hint of, boy, I wish that was me. You know, just a, just a tiny hint of that, you know? And so becoming aware of that, I wish it was me, or the jealousy thing, you can, you can kind of isolate that and eliminate that and then just focus on the pure appreciative joy. You know, it's so wonderful that this thing happened to that person. It's so wonderful. 
and I get to, I get to witness this. I get to see it. So um, that's what it means by kind of perfecting it. Is that you're, it's like, uh, you know, it's like purifying gold or some precious metal where, you know, you heat it up, and in that process, you're able to kind of separate off anything that isn't that pure thing. So this is kind of how we perfect that forthright effort, which is to just be aware of any subtle hints of anything that aren't that pure, that pure wholesome state. Um, so we'll leave it here. If you want to read on, uh, you can do that, and then uh, next week we'll continue talking about this. But I want to get into kind of the nitty-gritty and some practical ways that we can just really practice these four right efforts. Um, you'll find that they're just hugely transformative. Um, just wonderful. Just wonderful. So, um, so come back next week so we can talk about it. To be continued. So now let's spend a minute before we go and we'll, uh, we'll cultivate the four Brahma Viharas. And here's another example of just kind of out of nowhere making the conscious decision that, oh yes, let's cultivate these, um, these wholesome states of consciousness. And so here we are making that decision to do that. And if you want to ask yourself the question, is, is it possible for me to do that? Yes, it is. Let me try. Answer yes to the question. So we begin by just sort of uh, getting some sort of a vision of, of living beings, um, living beings around us here in this room, in our town, in our state, in our country, in our world, all the living beings, and cultivating this real sincere wish that all beings can be well, and that they can have enough, and that they can be free from suffering and from all the things that cause suffering, right? So just cultivate that feeling and, you know, don't be so concerned with the details of it. Just cultivate the feeling in your heart. And then the next one is, may all beings be surrounded by love and kindness. And wow, wouldn't that help? Wouldn't that help if if everyone on all sides of the political spectrum were just surrounded by love and kindness, and everyone we knew, everyone we've ever met, surrounded by love and kindness, if it had always been so. And the third one, may all beings experience real happiness and joy. This is the appreciative joy. We get to witness that. Our own our own happiness and joy from good things happening is, by nature, limited. It has to be. But there are boundless numbers of beings, and we can appreciate their joy. So if we do that, we multiply our own joy and happiness exponentially. May all beings be happy and joyful. And may all beings be equanimous and free and peaceful. So may they all feel like they're in a state where they just don't, they don't have to crave anything. There's no aversion. There's no fear. There's no hatred. There's no ill will. There's no greed. There's no anger. There's no delusion. There's just balance and peacefulness and freedom. And then finally, may you sharing this room and this space and time with me tonight, may you all be truly, truly happy. Namaskar, everybody. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming. Thank you. See you next week, I hope. I won't be here next week. Well, I won't see you then. Don't. <laughs> Are you? Yeah. Wonderful. What are you doing next week? I'm going to be backpacking with my sons down in Texas. Oh, wow. Like on the wow. So then you'll be <laughs> backpacking and camping. And yeah. Beautiful. Nice and warm. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. I've only been to Texas once, and it was like, it was in the middle of winter. I know that. And it was just, it was just so beautiful down there. Yeah, and I like the people too. I I felt like I could easily live here. You know, it was uh, it was a nice place. Right on the border, so to be. Yeah, yeah. 
No. So this is just an excursion for all of you. Yeah, so it was actually really, really fun because my son yeah. so wasn't doing right. anything for spring break, so he said, right. Dad, will you go on a backpacking trip with me? Nice. nice. Yeah. That's better than going to some beach somewhere and partying. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. Well, Brenda and Abby, it was great having you back. So you know, I hope you can make it again soon. Have a great time, Don. Thank you. See you soon. Bye bye. How do you, do you take a ferry to get to Nova Scotia, or can you actually drive? Bridges. Bridges, okay. Oh, I love that. Wow, those things, yeah. yeah it, just, it just depends on where you're crossing from. I mean, there are huh. people who do take ferries, huh. depending on where they're I like going over, over but we went up to New Brunswick, to St. John's, I think, oh, and then took the bridges. I like, oh, oh, so the, oh, the, yeah. the Bay of Fundy, the giant tide. Oh, oh, mm. oh. Wow. wow. Well, Nova Scotia is big, but uh, Pema Chadron, who's a, a really kind of, yeah, that's where she has her monastery. She's, uh, um, uh, yeah, she is the abbess of that monastery there. And it's a really, like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's she's a great teacher though. I've got a couple of her books and she's just awesome. Pema Chadron. P E M A C H O D R O N. Bye ladies. Uh, the New Richmond or the library carries a set of her CDs.